<laughs> cyberspace. So let's move on with, uh, I, ooh, I've got 23 minutes to go. I have much too much material, but I'll just speed along. So one of the things we noticed in the history of the internet is surprises. It took, it took a long time, and so there was time for surprises. So for example, on the upper left of this, you can see what computing looked like when the internet began. Does anyone recognize the punch card? Yeah. John does and a few others. And then while the, in the early days, say the 60s and 70s, technology crusaders like me, we were trying to convince the world that the, the way to do computing was interactive time sharing. And so the initial con computers connected by the internet were initially time share, interactive time sharing systems. But no sooner had we begun to make the internet work when these PCs came along, a completely no time sharing. This was interactive, but not time sharing. And of course, in recent days, the platform has evolved even further now to these, to these uh, uh, mobile thingies. So as we were building the internet, the very platforms that we were networking changed right out from under us in, in those decades. So in the case of energy, we can expect pretty much the same thing. We should be alert to the fact that what we take as a given problem is going to evolve uh, during this time. One particularly embarrassing surprise, uh, I, uh, that, that's Frank Hart who built the first packet switches of the internet, and that's a packet switch. I had one of those at, at MIT, and uh, it switched packets around the United States into the computers. There were four computers at MIT connected to it. There were none in Texas at that time, I might add. <laughs> anyway, I had to report uh, to my sponsor, DARPA, where the packets were going. And the teletype would print out uh, every, I could get a report of where these packets are going this month. And so packets would go from MIT and Harvard, MIT and UCLA, MIT and SRI. Uh, the biggest number on the page was the number of packets going from MIT to MIT. And I didn't report that. <laughs> because that was what we called incestuous traffic. We had not built the, uh, the internet. Uh, up until then, in order to connect computers in a building, because there weren't any buildings that had more than one computer in it. MIT happened to have four, and what we <coughs> called incestuous traffic later became LAN traffic. It was only four years later, after my first reports, that I was involved in developing Ethernet, and now most of the traffic on the internet is LAN tra is incestuous traffic, uh, never leaving the building. That was a big surprise, a kind of surprise we can expect in energy. Here's an even bigger surprise. When we were building the internet, we had all this copper from AT&T, and we managed that we had, we'd talk to buildings over that copper from AT&T, but then when we had to carry the packets across the country, we would use microwave or satellite, which is microwave. So long haul would be wireless, and local would be wired. Has anyone detected something funny about that? <laughs> it's the opposite of what we now do. Now we carry long haul on optical fibers, under the ground hopefully, and locally we use Wi-Fi, wireless. So that in the course of building the internet, the regimes of wireless and wireless flip. This is called the, the Negroponte switch that occurred, a very big surprise. And then here are my favorite surprises of the internet. Uh, calling them surprises is kind. These are bugs in the internet. And they stem from the fact that the internet was largely designed and built by grad students. So grad students are trusting, lovable, fuzzy, huggy people. So they didn't, we didn't bother to put any security in the internet because, well, it was full of grad students. And with quality of service, our goal in building, especially in the early days, was building a system that would transport a seven-bit character across the United States in under a half second. That was our goal. So quality of service. Uh, wasn't there. We started putting video over this network, and it started to struggle, and it's uh, recovering since. And of course, since, grad since graduate students get everything for free, uh, we didn't bother putting any economics in the internet. So over the last 20 or 30 years, you've seen the internet go through the agonies of how do you get things paid for, and how do you. So when we build the internet, when we solve energy, what do you say we not make these three mistakes? Let's learn from the internet and build security in, get quality of service, and build some economics in so it's a sustainable operation. Now here's a surprise. This is uh, the prices of stock. Uh, 
uh, and that blip in the middle is called the internet bubble, which for a while was a really big, horrible event, uh, starting March 10th, 2000. Since then, we've had the mortgage bubble burst, so no one thinks about this one anymore, because that was much bigger. In fact, we're still trying to recover from that. Uh, but this was a big, big surprise, and it, uh, it teaches us that there are surprises, and there will be an energy. So I'm, uh, being from New York, I'm going to be annoying. Global warming is a bubble. And how do I know? By the way, that is annoying, right? Global warming is a bubble. How do I know global warming is a bubble? <laughs> Al Gore and I inflated the internet bubble together. We used to travel around blabbing about how cool the internet was, and we inflated the internet bubble and it burst. He's back. <laughs> now, when we were inflating the internet bubble, it's true that the internet was growing. It was pretty much doubling every year right through the bubble. And after the bubble burst, it was still doubling every year. So it wasn't that the internet wasn't growing during the inflation bubble, and neither is it true that the Earth isn't getting warmer during global warming. It's just that when you, t when you uh, get into bubbles, uh, you take things too far, and you get into this uh, wild speculation. I think the global warming bubble has burst, or it's in the process of bursting, or it's going to burst soon. You can point, one of the ways you can tell is that that term has fallen out of use, and now it's called climate change. And, and now new, a new term is coming along. I'm not sure what, it being, or what it will be. And a lot of investments that were made in recent, the re last decade on the basis of a global warming hysteria, those investments have fallen on hard times, just as happened in the bursting of the internet bubble. Incidentally, I want you to know that the Earth is getting warmer. I've been, I climbed Kilimanjaro. I saw the glaciers there. You see, you can see in the upper left here, those are our little tents next to the glaciers. This is at 18,800 feet on the crater at the top of Kilimanjaro, and that glacier is melting. You can see me standing in the puddle over here on the right. I'd like to point out that that ice is only 11,000 years old. That is, the ice in that crater melts every 20,000 years or so when the, when the cycles go through. But the Earth is definitely getting warmer. So when I say global warming is a bubble, I'm not referring, I'm not what they call a denier. <laughs> On the other hand, bubbles are good. We are involved in an innovation process. We want to solve energy. That's innovation. What is one of our biggest enemies in innovation? And there's a word for it. It's called the status quo. And the status quo is big and mean and resourceful, and innovators need all the tools they can get, and speculative bubbles are one of those tools. So what I saw in the internet was that these occasional bubbles, and by the way, there are many bubbles. There was a land bubble, and a spreadsheet bubble, and a PC bubble, and a workstation bubble, and a, and a, uh, a Wi-Fi bubble, and the, the list goes on. And those bubbles coming by uh, accelerated investment, accelerated technological innovation, and they're a tool of innovators. And for Pete's sake, don't go to Washington and try to outlaw bubbles. You'll just slow everything down is a lesson that I learned. So going back now to your, your question about laws. Uh, the the, the uh, internet had lots of laws. The most famous is Moore's Law. Uh, by the way, there was a law called, before Moore's Law called Grosch's Law. Grosch was an IBM executive who had data showing that the cost of a computer went up as the square root of its computational power, a consequence of which is bigger and bigger computers are the way to go. And Moore came along and said, uh, not in so many words, smaller computers are better. And, all the, um, and this is one of the ways that uh, Silicon Valley stole all the energy and innovation away from Massachusetts. Because the people in Massachusetts got hung up on Grosch's law, and the people in California got hung up on Moore's law. And it, so it matters which laws you choose, and we ought to have some laws for energy. I hasten to add my favorite law, uh, Metcalf's law. This is the title of my forthcoming book, which I haven't even begun to write. <laughs> but going to your question, uh, Professor Sachs, uh, whose company uh, I backed as a uh, venture capitalist, I got him to produce this slide, charting the uh, declining costs of, of photovoltaic solar uh, power generation 
as a function of the number of gigawatts shipped. And it really is quite a long, uh, quite a long line, and it goes for many, many years, and he's projecting a crossover. That is, that solar will first become uh, uh, cheaper than uh, oil and then gas, and then ultimately his goal is to make uh, PV cheaper than uh, coal. And there's sort of a law there, there's sort of a, a curve, a, per, a persistent curve going out some time. But we do need other laws uh, akin to Moore's law, and then we'll see an acceleration of innovation. Now, speaking of laws, there's Washington, where a lot of laws are made. And one of the things you observe in the internet is that when you go to Washington, it's a pro-am. And innovators are the ams. When you go to Washington, you don't, you get snookered. You get uh, taken advantage of by people in Washington. I've observed this in the internet. You go to Washington to get stuff, you sometimes get the wrong stuff, like corn ethanol, for example. Or an even bigger example, the Department of Energy, which was founded in the 70s under the Carter administration for the purposes of reducing our dependence on foreign oil. It's 30 years old. Its budget long ago passed $25 billion per year. How are we doing on our dependence on foreign oil? No progress at all. Uh, so we went to Washington in the 70s in, uh, and uh, made the DOE. And I suggest now that we're going to Washington again, maybe the first thing we should do is fix the DOE. One of the things I really hold against the DOE is nuclear. We haven't built a new nuclear reactor in 30 years since the formation of DOE and the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And I just have, as a venture capitalist, some good news, what I consider good news is nuclear seems to be coming back in the form of startups. And these startups aren't promoting $15 billion nuclear reactors that we've, um, we, have tw uh, we have 104 of them in the United States that generate 20% of our electricity. They're all 30 years or, or more old. Uh, but now these new startups are coming in with distributed nuclear uh, aimed at solving the basic problems of proliferation and economics and scale and safety, um, so we have some hope. And by the way, this is a photograph from the inside of a nuclear reactor, and I'm just asking you, what color is that? <laughs> it's blue. There's a certain poetry here. Now, now that I've been hard on, briefly hard on Washington, and I only have 10 minutes left, oh gosh, I have a remedy to this problem, um, the problem of running out of time, but I'll tell you about that later. <laughs> Washington did actually help. Washington um, uh, broke the monopolies. The AT&T monopoly and the IBM monopolies were broken by the federal government. Uh, the the f uh, federal government was a, a very influential lead investor, a uh, customer, in buying early packet switches. Federal government made important standards, uh, one of which was TCPIP, which is the current uh, standard for internet operations. But what is the most important thing that Washington did in the history of the internet, and therefore likely to be the most important thing in the history of energy? You stayed out of it. Well, I like stay out of the way, <laughs> except for this exception, uh, namely research. Uh, Government-funded, federally-funded research was pivotal in the development of the internet, and we should expect it will be pivotal in the evolution of energy. So where should that research be done is a question. And I've looked back at the history of the internet, and I can tell you that doing research in the laboratories of companies is not the best way to do it. Because the only companies that can afford to do research are monopolies. And monopolies have two negative features. One is they tend to overcharge their customers, which is where they get the money to buy the research. And two is they're the status quo. They're not in a position to take new developments and bring them to the market. They, they're invested in the way things are, and they're very slow to bring things to market. So how about government laboratories instead? Say the, uh, the laboratories of the Department of Energy. Not a very productive use of research dollars, in my experience. They're just huge jobs programs, each with two senators and a bunch of congressmen attached. And they uh, get more and more money every year and are very unproductive, I think, as a research. So where should the research be done? And in the, what the internet tells us, it should be done at research universities, like, for example, this one. Uh, there are about 100 research, uh, probably more, but a, at least 100 uh, excellent research universities in the United States. And if the internet is any guide, that's where we should be doing our energy research, not at 
a government monopoly, uh, not at government laboratories or monopolies. Now, at some point in a research discussion, a gray-haired energy codger will say, there, since a, energy is of enormous scale and complexity, there will be no silver bullets. Well, the internet experience is the opposite. In the internet, I mean, I could name a dozen uh, silver bullets that is very important breakthroughs that enable the creation of the internet. And so I think we should uh, tell these folks to stop saying there are going to be no silver bullets and just get busy developing the silver bullets. My favorite silver, bu silver bullet in the internet is dense wave division multiplexing, which sort of arrived in the 90s. And here's the difference it made. This is a, a transmission of data on optical fibers, uh, putting many transmissions on the same fiber at the same time. Dense wave division multiplexing. And here's what it did. When I used to leave Long Island for college, I'd get in my little Volkswagen, and my mom would say, when you get to Boston, call to let me know you're safe. Let the phone ring three times, and then hang up. I love you, but not that much. <laughs> and now, you don't think that way about telephone calls. You make many, 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 many more telephone calls because telephone bandwidth is now squanderably abundant thanks to, largely, the silver bullet of dense wave division multiplexing. Now, when you have those silver bullets, you then want to put them in the hands of uh, vehicles of innovation. And the internet teaches us that the following vehicle is the most productive. Fiercely competing teams of research professors, their graduating students, scaling entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, strategic partners, and early adopters. And if the internet is any guide, teams like that will build the internet, will solve energy. This is Cisco Systems, one such company. The upper left, you see the, the two Stanford researchers. Up the upper right is the wizened old, experienced uh, CEO of the company, John Morgridge. And the lower right is the rapacious venture capitalist who invested in their company. Then there's uh, Akamai, another example. This one is closer to my home. Uh, this is the professor from MIT, his two graduate students. And this young man was killed on 9-11, I might add. And that man on the right was my, uh, is my partner at Polaris. And he was the president of IBM uh, US. And then he went to become CEO of Akamai, which at the time was an algorithm. And by the time he was done, was uh, downloading, as it does today, content for the internet. Once again, that same model. And then there's the Google example. The professors in the upper left, Andy Bechtelsheim, founder of Sun Microsystems, made more money on Google than he did on Sun. Uh, you see the venture capitalists on the right, very famous VCs. And then you see in the middle the two, uh, Larry at the top and Sergey at the bottom, and then the uh, experienced scaling entrepreneur, Eric Schmidt, in the middle. Again, another example of this motif of innovation. And we're going to bring that motif to this complicated problem. So this is a diagram of the internet, uh, sorry, of the energy system, which I don't ask you to read right now. Just look and see how complicated it is. And so how can we learn from the internet about to deal with that complexity? And the answer is that the internet began with a concerted effort to develop an architecture. And one of the key features of that architecture was layering. Do we still study the seven levels of the ISO reference model? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's these seven levels. And I lived my whole life uh, to date at these two levels and lived a rich, full life. Had a family, went to dinner. Whereas all those people were living separate lives. Like, uh, they had all the fun, the people at the higher levels. And, and here's what that leveling does. It allows for specialization. It allows for progress at each of the layers at its own pace. And the most important thing is it allows for serendipity. In the design of the interfaces among these levels, there was an effort to make them beautiful and general purpose. And as a result of that, people could be creative on top of them. So for example, Ethernet was invented in 1973. And the World Wide Web was invented in 1989. And the World Wide Web works on Ethernet, even though they were developed in different countries in different decades. That's the kind of serendipity that I'm talking about. Oh, and Facebook. When we designed Ethernet, I can assure you, we were not thinking of Facebook. 
So I've, I've run out of time, basically, and I have a bunch more slides. Uh, so let me um, not do them. But what, I, what remains are a few more technical recommendations. That is, for example, in the upper left is my first computer, the IBM 7094, and below is a microprocessor. So on the upper right is what today's power plant looks like. And it's pretty clear if the internet is any guide, when we're done solving energy, energy will be distributed. Distributed sources of energy, distributed sinks with a network in between, and so on. So uh, in these slides, so these slides are available to you um, in a PDF along with my speaking notes. And I got two more minutes. And those slides are available to you. Please correct me if I'm wrong. www.engr dot utexas dot edu. Got it? And uh, all 65 of my slides and their speaking notes are there, and you're welcome to look at them. Uh, and I urge you to attend the, the uh, UT Energy Forum on the 3rd and 4th. And now transporting our bits, I'd like to thank my audience from around the I know some of those folks are from, I can't, are from Canada. <laughs> I can look at, by the way, I have an avatar too. Let's see if I can see my avatar. Oh, I've lost my avatar. <laughs> Just hit the B key, Bob. Hit the B key? Yes. Oh, what did that do? That should uh, give you a view of yourself. My favorite. You can hit it again. If, uh, just toggle it. There I am. Anyway, I'm there too. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've been meaning to go in and alter my avatar to make it than that. But, uh, so with the remaining uh, uh, 15 seconds, uh, would anyone like to uh, ask some questions or make some arguments? Yes. Why does Austin exist? <laughs> uh, why did I choose to come to Austin? Why did we, my wife and I, decide? Actually, that topic has received more attention than I wanted. There's actually a, a survey was taken of the a population of Boston, and why Bob went to Austin. And uh, they voted on one of my real reasons, uh, so they were perceptive. Uh, at Austin is the University of Texas, which has the top 10 engineering school, and I are an engineer. And, uh, and it's warmer here. <laughs> and there's no income tax. <laughs> and in and one of my visits here, I got to go to uh, Austin uh, City Limits and got to stand 10 feet from Don Henley. <laughs> so as soon as I, I saw Don Henley, I said, I got to move here. <laughs> Actually, uh, in all seriousness, after 10 years of being a venture capital, my attention span was violated. I decided to find a new career, um, uh, settled on being a professor, and then started walking around looking for someone who might be interested in this kind of, I wanted to be a professor of innovation. And, uh, and met, uh, came to NI Week, and gave a talk at um, uh, National Instruments, and met the dean and pitched him on my being a professor of innovation. And then he and the rest of the faculty said, that's a damn good idea. Why don't you come here? So I said, yes. So that's how it happened. So thanks for asking. Anyone, uh, other questions? Yes. Yeah, real quickly, you sweep clean energy as the sorting thing. Uh, information technology as the hot spot for general electrolytization? No. So the internet era, era is not over. It's, uh, I can see it in the activity at our venture capital uh, meetings every week. So there's intense investment and activity and innovation going on in, in, uh, in technology, information technology, Facebook applications, for example. Um, so no, it, the internet isn't over. So this is a hey, life Brian. choice. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like... Oh, is there a question from cyberspace? There's a apparently great satisfaction, dissatisfaction. I, I have a question, Bob. Go ahead. What uh, area do you figure we're going to get our miniaturized power sources? Are we 
What are we thinking here? Solar, nuclear, something else? Well, distributed doesn't necessarily mean miniaturized, but for example, solar is a great example for distributed energy generation. And, the and there are various forms of solar, not just photovoltaics, thermal solar, photosynthesis. Uh, then there's uh, nuclear, and particularly distributed nuclear, which I think will be, it. no, I'm not imagining yet, I'm not imagining, maybe I should imagine nuclear reactors this big. Right now, the nuclear reactors I've seen, the distributed ones, are about as big as that table. They cost about $25 million, not $15 billion, and they generate. So you take one of these and you bury it for uh, 10 years, and it runs a city, 27 megawatts. Uh, there isn't, we know that that's possible because we have 12 nuclear-powered uh, aircraft carriers going all over the world. So we know it's possible to build nuclear reactors that size, uh, just not doing it in the civilian sector yet. Yes? I don't think I have anything wise to say about that. I'm, uh, is that happening, really? I thought the internet routes around everything. Uh, yeah. It does fly in the face of Metcalfe's law. Because if you break something in half, then its value goes down as the square. So you, why would you do that? I guess you'd do it if you were uh, trying to impose your will on people. Uh, that's a good reason. That's why I do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have until February to design a course, and um, I was at lunch today. I was pitched on what I think the answer is going to be, uh, but I'm not at liberty to discuss it at this time because I haven't gotten the dean's approval quite yet. But I, I hope to be um, so. I, I, I hope to be uh, teaching and doing research and practicing innovation. And uh, uh, is this course going to be in towards innovation, or is it going to be more technical towards uh, innovation? Yeah, I've uh, talked to the faculty of uh, electrical and computer engineering, and we've agreed that I shouldn't teach any of those courses. <laughs> yes. Please. Well, um, as a graduate student, this is pretty much a practical problem that I face. Well, um, I'm glad you think so highly about research that's done in universities, but one problem is we have five years or so to do it. And then, you know, there are a few, very few of us who are smart enough to be selected to become professors. So, you know, um, do you think there is any sustainable way that we people who do research and do produce results could go on doing research rather than, you know, joining big company X as a finance coder or something. Well, let me reassure you, despite what I think, um, industrial research is going to continue. And the Department of Energy labs are going to continue. So don't worry. They're still there, because no one ever listens to me. Uh, uh, but on the professor thing, so I, I view the research professors as the, the long haul. And then the students come and spend four or five years, or 14 years, depending. And uh, they carry with them into the world a particular sub-innovation of that community of research into the world. And then the, and then the innovation system uh, takes off, takes it from there. So one of the things I want to focus on is uh, enhancing the operation of that innovation system. But uh, so you're just. I guess your concern is you, can't, you don't think you're going to get a job as a professor, so you're worried that everyone's going to shut down all the other research labs as a result of this talk today? <laughs> Obviously not, but I was, I was just asking, is there, do you think, um, what do you think grad students should do if they want to go on being creative after, you know, they're out of school and no longer protected? Like, do you think, it would be a good idea to join industrial research, or would it be a good idea to start a startup with an innovative new idea, or what would be a good way forward? 
Well, I'll give you the advice I gave my daughter. Uh, go work at Facebook. <laughs> now, she's not in research. She's in sales. But there are all these companies that are recent startups which have exciting new ideas in them. And that would be one way to uh, express your creativity. And not necessarily Facebook, but Google or Microsoft. I'm thinking IT. Or you could join the research labs of Exxon or Chevron or Shell or if you're interested in energy or General Electric. Um, and if you're interested in startups, that would be a good place to go anyway. And then you do, as I went, people always recommend what they did. I went to Xerox for eight years and then started my company. So I thought of Xerox as sort of graduate school, uh, postgraduate school. So I did an eight year postdoc at Xerox before starting my company. So industrial research is uh, probably a good place to go, too. Any other questions, please? Where are we with fusion? Where are we with fusion? <laughs> Much to the embarrassment of physicists, every day a fusion reactor flies across the sky and says, <laughs> <laughs> and so I visited the Department of Energy, some of the Department of Energy's fusion facilities, and they have billions of dollars and decades to go, according to their own plans, before they have fusion. And I've also visited two individual guys in garages in Massachusetts who claim to have fusion almost ready in their basements. Um, I couldn't convince my- Are you away? <laughs> That's what I said when I saw the, uh, yes? Do you have a question from cyberspace? So Nick and Chris, does that mean they can't hear us? No. Uh, hey, Bob. If you could wiggle your mouse, we, we lost your, uh, we need to get active so we could hear. <laughs> there, sorry. <laughs> Should I do anything, Chris, or are we? No, no, you're good. It's just that um, uh, your avatar went idle and we couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. You're good. Thank you. Well, that reminds me. I do have another plug to do. And uh, let's see. I do, maybe I do this, and then I do that. So for those of you who have additional questions, I'm going to experiment. I'm going to do regular office hours, too. But for tomorrow, from 2 to 5, I'm going to be available online at this Avaya web room. So if you at utexas.avayalive.com, and you see the laser pointer is pointing. This, this is another cool feature. Uh, you see there's some, uh, Chris is standing off using his, his cyber laser pointer. <laughs> I expect Darth Vader to come in from the right. <laughs> So, uh, Business collaboration can be fun, too. So please, if you'd like, you can experience the uh, immersive, collaborative, uh, transport your bits, not your atoms, technology tomorrow from 2 to 5 uh, at utexas.avialive.com. Any other questions? We're 10 minutes over. I don't know if, is it important that we're 10 minutes over? Okay. Other than the fact that I broke the promise. Uh, yes? Uh, $25 I wrote the Wall Street Journal op-ed on that very uh, subject. It didn't touch on fusion. It was focused on fission. So here's the, these five startups that I've studied as a venture capitalist offer the following proposition. Invest $100 million in our A round. We're going to spend $50 million developing our new reactor. And then we're going to pay $50 million to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to approve our design. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has not approved a new design in 30 years. Would you like to invest? <laughs> and the venture capitalists are no dummies, at least I'm not. And we said, no, we can't do that. It's too, first of all, it's too much money. And second of all, the likelihood of success is pretty low. The other problem is, is that the, the, uh, there is an entrenched status quo nuclear industry that doesn't like distributed nuclear. 
So the likelihood of getting a distributed a small nuke through the NRC is even lower now, thanks to the big nuke people who are in, you know, have captured the regulatory structure of the NRC and are discouraging the small modular reactors, although that battle is going on right now. Is that responsive to your question? Right. Has anything changed since you wrote that? Um, yes, uh, the situation's improved. Uh, you know, we have a really cool head of the uh, Department of Energy, and uh, and and the president are all pro moving things along. And so the NRC has set up some special activities related to the eventual approval of small modular reactors. There's also a bias at the NRC toward uh, light water reactors. All 104 of our reactors are light water. These distributed uh, reactors generally don't use light water. So the NRC has been called the Light Water Regulatory Commission. Uh, that, that is, this new technology is off-putting to them. So there's a regulatory um, slowdown there and not helped by the status quo. Yes? Uh, how long do you think before we cross the tipping point and more people are buying electric cars without combustion engines versus traditional ones? Like how far away is that? You own an electric car, don't you? Maybe. <laughs> I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It'll, be, it'll surprise us, I think. Um, no, I, I don't have an yeah, okay. informed guess about that. Because there's lots of chicken and egg problems about electric cars and you know, batteries and charging stations and so on. That all, it's hard to say. It's chaotic. It's hard to say when it'll break. But it's going to break. If you've ever ridden an electric car, as I have, uh, it's really cool. And the, it's, it's dangerously quiet and amazingly torqueful. And, um, and a much better way of producing motion from energy. Yes? The, uh, one of the uh, ways of um, so, uh, dodging the NRC is to take your startup overseas. So there's, some of the answers aren't very good. Some of them are better. So the United Kingdom is, seems to be a little bit more flexible. Um, France has a nuclear industry, and, and they 80 percent of their electricity they have 100 or so reactors too, but 80 percent of their electricity uh, comes from nuclear. So there's promising opportunities for these startups there. And the other place you can take a new reactor design is to the U.S. military, which doesn't have to go through the NRC. So some of the startups are um, offering these small nukes for deployment overseas in, in uh, war uh, theater of war. Um, but the NRC is the gold standard, they say. So all the, uh, all the reactor designers want to have their designs approved by the NRC because that's the gold standard for approval. So uh, uh, they just don't, they might run out of money in the meantime. Yes? I was, I was looking at the timeline, and I saw that you grew up you know, during the, the peak of the Cold War and during uh, Vietnam and Korea. And I was wondering if you're disappointed in today's youth sort of a premise to your question, which I have trouble with. Uh, but no, I'm not disappointed in today's youth. I've got two of my own who I really like a lot. And um, um, I, think you should very, I think you should be outraged at the spending in Washington, although not necessarily on the military. There's a lot of spending in Washington we should cut back, including military. Uh, but no, I'm not outraged. In fact, I haven't noticed anyone being shy, actually. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, unless you mean um, protests in the streets like we had during the 60s. I, I don't think, I don't think that was, a, I didn't think it was a good idea at the time. <laughs> you should hear, you should hear what people today think happened in the 60s. But I was there. And actually anyone, the joke is anyone who claims to remember what happened in the 60s clearly wasn't there. <laughs> I've actually, uh, uh, gotten a venture capital pitch from a company that has physical avatars for, uh, so they're, they exist now. Um, I don't know, that's, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, 
Uh, we're always going to be transporting our atoms a little bit. The question is, do we? Uh, a lot of the transport of atoms that we do now is completely unnecessary. Commuting to work and business travel. Short story: When PCs were new, it was argued PCs would never take off except as word processors, because the only people who would ever type on a keyboard were secretaries. And professionals and executives would never type on a keyboard. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been around, but that was complete nonsense. The, the similar nonsense is people will never give up travel, because in order to conclude a sale, you must press the flesh. And I think that truism is going the same way as no one will ever type on a keyboard. And that we'll, we won't have to do all that rent a car, stay in a hotel, go through security, fly around the world just to do a sales meeting. A lot of those sales meetings can be done electronically, and as, and as is daily commuting. I hear there's a commuting problem here in Austin. So I plan to walk to work. And that'll solve that problem. I think maybe we should wrap up now. What do you think? Well, thank you very much, Bob.